Hey, so hope everyone's having a good night. Um, I'm just sitting here programming some parts, so I thought, what better chance to uh, go live and to demonstrate um, some of the ways that I program. Cool, so just jumping into the manufacturer environment. Uh, this is one of the front plates for the new Vertigo uh, CNC machine. <clears throat> so, to start with, the most important thing is to always select your model. Uh, I'm going to set my orientation, um, select my z-axis plane, top of my part. Um, x-axis plane is going to be across this line. Um, stock box point, we'll make it this back corner. Um, when I'm programming on the half, I always program uh, my datum or my zero point um, on the back left, um, just because that's my hard jaw, so it doesn't change. I'm just going to program my width. Um, stock size is 145 millimeters. Y depth is 101. 25.4. Uh, Let's check. Uh, that's pretty good. No, actually, I will use some small stock. There's a little bit of wastage there. Um, 19, that'll be right. Then I will change my bottom offset to be, uh, we'll go 2.5, we'll take 0.5 off the top there. <coughs> cool, looks right. Interrupting Scott's workout, good on you Scott. I'm um, just going to rename my operation to op number one. Um, always really important to rename your operations. Um, you just click once and uh, click again, click again, but just make sure you leave a gap between the clicks. Otherwise, it will um, open up the settings if you click too fast. Um, so click once, click again, um, but just don't double click because otherwise it'll open the settings up straight away. Um, first thing I'm going to throw in here is I am going to do a facing operation. The normal way I would do a facing operation is using the facing tool, grabbing my face mill and pressing OK. The problem that I find using the facing operation is end up um, with a center line, a hard center line. It's almost like the material work hardens in between the two passes. Um, and it, it just looks horrible to be honest. So what I prefer doing is using a 3D adaptive. Um, I select the top of my part, um, turn stock to leave off and press OK and I find I get a lot better finish with doing, doing it this way. Yeah, so uh, they're the two facing operations that I could do. Um, so I could just do a normal facing operation, but like I said, I get a, you, I seem to get a really odd mark in between the, uh, um, the two passes. Um, and it's almost like the material work hardens. It's actually hard in the center here. Um, so I much prefer using an adaptive and doing smaller step overs. Um, and I think it, it, it adds a nice pattern to the back of the part. So if there are any scratches that occur, um, they're less noticeable as well, so I'll just delete that guy. Cool. Next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my drill because I need to drill all these holes here. Uh, first thing I should actually do is grab my chamfer mill and 
just centre drill these because they're really important getting them all in the right. Oh, no, made a mistake there. It's the same diameter. That's what I want to do. Um, and obviously you don't want to drill that deep with a chamfer mill because um, there you go, your chamfer mill would break. So what I'll do is I'll just go into my heights tab. I will go from hole to and I will go negative uh, 0.5 is fine from the whole top. Um, I'll change the drilling cycle to and then we'll just put a dwell in that so I'll go 0 0.2 um, reason why I do that is because I found that if I just do a straight drill, you end up with when, with a chamfer mill for peck drilling, you end up with a really uneven surface and its drill still has the opportunity to wander. Um, so by just allowing it to dwell for a second, um, definitely get a better finish and um, yeah. <laughs> Next thing I'm going to do, again, just grab do another drilling operation. I'm going to use a 5mm drill. Again, select my first hole, select same diameter. Um, drill, hole bottom. I'm going to go stock bottom. The uh, reason why I'm going to do that is just because I want it to drill all the way through and when I flip the part over, um, I'm not having to remove lots of material when I'm doing my bore because um, that way I can save my end mill. Drills are cheap. Cool. Um, actually, while I'm here, I might just add that to that drilling operation. But I need to auto merge segments. No, that doesn't work. Uh, so I might just need to change my heights to selection. That's better. Cool. The reason why I did that is because where this drilling operation was starting in this hole here, um, it was starting at the bottom of this chamfer here. Um, and there's material still there, of course. Uh, not that it would matter because the drill's always spun up, but um, still good practice to just in case. Um, the only thing I'm going to do is I'm, in that drilling operation, I'm just going to change it and I'm going to change it to a chip break with a partial retract and I'm going to do a 15 millimeter drill. Um, my chip break distance, this is how, how high the drill lifts um, between to break the chips basically. So I'm going to go 2.5. I have reasonable good luck, reasonable luck with that. Um, and softer materials, you generally want to change your pecking depth to be low, uh, sorry, not as deep. Um, so you might want to go like five millimeters, but for this case, I know this is 6061, so it's pretty good. So, um, and then I'll just, feeds and speeds are all in there um, for this drill. So I'll just press OK. <clears throat> good stuff. Next thing I'm going to do is I just want to get rid of the material around the outside of my part here. So to do that, I'm actually actually just going to use a 2D adaptive operation. I'm going to use tool 11, which is a big um, half-inch roughing end mill. And I'm just going to select the outside of my part. Axial stock to leave, zero. Cool. And I'm just going to do a bore to get rid of that material. I'm going to change the bottom height to stock bottom negative three millimeters. Now the reason I'm going to do that is because um, my roughing mill has a slight radius on the bottom of it. It's about a one mil radius or something along those lines. Um, Otherwise, I'll end up with a little lip. And the reason why I want to go all the way through is because I want to use this bore as my datum. 
um, for probing on the other side. So that way, when I flip the part over, I can use the bore to um, get the everything nice and square in the middle. Um, again, I think from a video a little while ago, I was talking about using datums um, for zeroing your parts. It uh, makes life a whole lot easier. Um, again, having this problem here where the bore, if you look at that, it's starting just below the chamfer there, and that's less than ideal because uh, for that first millimetre, um, the end mill's just going to plunge into the stock, and end mills are not drills. So um, what I'm going to do here is just go a couple of ways, I think. No, nope, I'm just going to do a selection. I'm going to... No, change it to model top. I might just add a little bit to that, um, just in case. Uh, last thing you want to do, like I said, is for, for, for any reason, if you've made any mistakes or if I've made any mistakes, it's always good to just give myself a little bit more of a margin there. And I'll press OK. Um, last thing I need to do is I need to bore in here. Um, that is... This tool up here, the tape measure, inspect is and, um, it's an eight millimeter diameter bore. So I'm going to use this guy. So I'm going to set the bore. Again, I'm just going to start from the whole top plus a margin, just add a millimeter to it. Um, if I was really worried about time on machining time, I would probably reduce that or drop it down a little bit lower. But I'm not worried about machining time for this because it's a fairly fast part as it is. Um, this whole part I could machine and probably do in maybe a minute and a half, two minutes, and then do the other the other side in maybe three minutes, four to push. Um, depending on what I do with it, so. Cool. <clears throat> Last thing that I need to do is I need to do a contour because in my adaptive, what I've done, ah, not that adaptive, nope, this adaptive, I have left 0.5 millimeters around the outside of the stock. So, what I'm going to do here is just go into 2D Contour. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to grab my... Ah, oh, that's wrong. I'll delete that one. Aluminium Tool Library. Um, it's not in there either, okay. That's what I want. Copy Tool. I really need to sort my tool libraries out one day. Um, it's not a priority right at the moment, unfortunately. I'm just paste. The great thing about Fusion, right, is, and this is freaking awesome, is the fact that I can go document that's currently open, which is this full sheet machine document. Um, the the tool library is showing up in here. I can copy that and I can bring it. If I've made any edits or changes to that tool and that I like, if something's working well for me, um, I've got a recipe that's working well, um, I can then go and bring that and use that. So I'm just going to come back into this part. I'm just going to paste it into this and then I'm going to grab that tool there. Um, it's just a 7.889 millimeter flat end mill. Um, technically it's meant to be an 8 millimeter but um, I think I've said to a few people lately that uh, end mills are never what they say they are. Um, if, if an end mill really says it's 8 millimeters and, and it turns out to be really 8 millimeters, um, I call bullshit on that one. Cool, I will grab that. And geometry, I'm just going to select this bottom edge. Cool, I've got a chamfer on that one, it's all good. And that's a pain in the ass. Um, okay, cool. What, I'll, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do... 
finishing overlap. Now, one thing that happens here, if I was to just push OK and we'll load that toolpath, is the tool is going to, if I simulate that, uh, I have to turn stock off, turn to flute, there we go. Um, if I simulate that and you see where that tool comes in and where it exits around this other side, we're going to get a little vertical witness mark right about there. And that is one of my pet hates in life, witness marks. So what I'm going to do is go back into Edit, Paths, and I'm just going to do a finishing overlap of just a couple of mils. It doesn't, I don't even need to do that much, to be honest. Um, force of habit more than anything. Um, I'm going to repeat my finishing pass. Cutter is only an 8 mil cutter, and it's going to be cutting 16 mils deep. Um, it's only taking 0.5 off, but I'm I I really want to make sure that um, the part's two size. Um, I will get a little bit of rubbing by doing it this way, but I'm not overly concerned. Um, I seem to get really good finishes um, with this cutter anyway. So um, even even with a finishing pass or a um, spring pass, some people call it. <coughs> Cool. It's looking pretty good. Um, press OK on that one. Now, what I want to do is I... Okay, so that's going to go around twice. Um, I need to clean this hole up, this bore up here, because um, the problem is, is this guy would have left it a mess. And speaking of this guy, I actually might come in here, go into my passes tab and leave some stock. Um, just leave point... I don't know, 0.25. Um, reason being is because this is a big roughing end mill and it's got chip breakers on the outside of it. And the chip breakers do not leave a very good finish at all. So um, this is where I'm better off coming in and cleaning that up. So, oh, give me a second. The machine was beeping at me, um, and I really want to get this done tonight, so um, I would prefer it have, not having to restart it. I will duplicate this guy, and I will delete this chain. Um, I'm just going to click on this here, and then I'm going to change my heights. I'm going to go section, and I'm going to flip part over, and my selection is going to be this guy. Now, why did I do that? Because if I go into my geometry tab, um, I'm selecting this chain here or this contour here. But the problem is, is I have a wee chamfer on the bottom here. So that means I'm only going to go to this deep. Now, one thing here I could do is I could have just gone two chain negative, I don't know, 0.5 millimeters. Or I could be lazy and I could just grab the selection because let's pretend I don't know how big that chamfer is and I can just go and select it. Makes it nice and easy. Cool. Uh, same thing, it's just gonna go around twice um, and it's still got a little bit of overlap in there. I'll either slow this guy down a little bit. Um, it is cutting a very small bore, so I'll just do 1500 um, millimeters a minute. I'll drop that down to lead in, lead out's fine. Um, ramp feed route, just drop that down to a thousand. Not that it matters. Cool. You're probably asking um, how I know what to change to. Um, lots of trial and error is what I know. <laughs> um, I do have a fancy calculator, this guy here. Oh, this guy here that I use all the time. Um, this is my best friend. Um, I don't use it a lot. I used to use it all the time. Um, most things I've got a fairly good feeling for now. Um, there are certainly some things that I do rely on this for, though. Um, it does cost, uh, but definitely worth checking out. Cool. I'm just going to do a 2D chamfer. Just chamfer all of my screw holes here, my drill holes, sorry. Um, and I'm just going to throw a, I don't know, 0.25 mil chamfer on that. 0.25. My cutter is. One thing that's really cool about Fusion, again, is um, like with chamfer mills here, 
if a chamfer mill has been used within the same document before, and I go in and use a chamfer operation, it will automatically select the last used chamfer mill, um, even if it wasn't the previously used tool. Um, it just makes life a little bit easier again. Um, but just always do check what, what, what's written in here. And always, if you're not sure, jump in your library and just double check and you can look down into the tool information here. <clears throat> cool. Um, one thing I always do with champ chamfers, I always do a finishing overlap, just a millimeter. Um, reason being is because it's so common just to see a little witness mark again where that tool enters and exits. Um, I mean, the reason why that witness mark occurs is just a little bit of deflection. The tools hit the material nice and hard, and um, and it's just it's just deflected that little bit. Um, all the materials deflected just that, that that little bit as well. So um, again, just something that definitely recommend. Cool. Um, and then I am going to come in and I am going to get rid of these these other chamfers. Interestingly enough, to do these other chamfers here, I need to use a 2D contour, 2D contour, um, which you can use with your chamfer mill. Um, and I will chamfer this, and I will chamfer this. Yes, that's right. Cool. One thing we need to be careful of here, though, is that we chamfer to offset now the problem is, is if I was to just load this, press OK, it'll work. Um, but I will probably snap my tip off because if we look at this, where that blue line is, that is where the tip of the tool is. Now the surface area of that tool, because it is so small, um, the surface speed, sorry, is going to be very, very low at the tip here. Um, I have broken my fair, fair, sh fair share of tips off chamfer mills, so um, just word to the wise, uh, make sure you add some tip offset. Um, generally like to add about a millimetre, but add as much as you can without um, rubbing on the shaft of the cutter. Or the rubbing on the shank, sorry. <clears throat> Cool. Um, chamfer width, I can modify that if I want as well, but I don't need to. Um, don't need to repeat. Oh, nah. Don't need to repeat the finishing pass. Let's add a millimeter of finishing overlap again. Really important, um, just to reduce that witness mark that you'll see. Cool. That's looking pretty good. So, we've got. Uh, our facing operation, we've got our um, drilling operation that's just going to do a spot drill, a bunch of spot drills here. Um, going to come in with this guy here, which is a 5mm drill. Um, going to do an adaptive with a big half inch rougher. <clears throat> machine the bore, I'm going to use the bore as my datum, my offset um, for the second op when I flip the part over. Um, do this bore, do a contour of tool 21, it's an 8mm end mill. Contour, chamfer, chamfer. Cool, and we will just simulate this guy quickly. Stock on, and we will watch how it comes out. Uh, change some to... Pretty sure it'll come out pretty good. Cool. That's what I was hoping for. That is looking pretty good. Now, what I'll do is I will set up for op two. Now, the way that I do that is I just duplicate an operation because 
um, I've got all my stock settings in there. So I just come up, I'll right click on this existing operation, let's hit duplicate. Um, I'll rename this guy to op2. So I drop down. Uh, I'm just going to delete all these tools and start again. It's always good practice. Um, biggest thing here is here is before you start uh, adding adding tools and adding operations, adding toolpaths to this, make sure you activate this. Otherwise, if I was to go and flip this over now and I was to start adding my toolpaths and that, um, they will be added to op one, not op two. Cool. So I just want to edit this because obviously we were on the run the wrong one now. Um, so I'm just going to exit my Z axis. My Z axis is going to, going to become this face. Um, my X axis is still the same place. That's fine. Um, I'm going to change my origin to select. And my origin is going to become the bottom of that part there. So what I've done is I've just selected the outside circle there and now what it means is go and zero the, the machine out. Um, my zero point is going to become the bottom of the part, centre of the bore. Um, the reason why I'm doing that is because second op, always best to zero off the part or off an existing face that is visible on the part. Um, so this happens to be a face that is visible on the part. <clears throat> cool. Um, the only thing I need to do here is I need to go back into my stock and I need to change my model position from uh, offset from Z bottom to Z top. Reason being is because op1 is from the Z bottom, op2, Z top, because that's where the excess stock is. That's because I don't have the part sitting central in the stock at the moment. Cool. So, um, ah, one thing I forgot to do is this here is going to be, I'm going to use um, multiple work offsets. So I need to make this work offset number two. So that is work offset number two is G55. Um, doesn't matter what machine you're using, whether it's a, a Haas or a Vertigo CNC, you do have the ability to use multiple work offsets. Um, up the top in CNC JS, I don't even know. No, I don't have CNC JS. Um, up the top in CNC JS, on the right hand side, there's a little drop down, and if you you can actually select your work coordinate system, so you can select G54, G55, G56, um, and for reference, zero is G54. One is, G, is also G54, uh, two is G55, three is G56, and so on and so forth. Um, why would you want to do that? Um, so that way you can zero out one part on the left-hand side of the machine, for instance, and we'll call that G54, and that'll be work coordinates offset number one or zero. Um, and then you might want to put a part on the right-hand side of the machine and you, or a jig or something like that, and we'll call that uh, uh, G54 offset number two. Um, so really helpful. Uh, little trick there. Um, that's how you can do sort of an op one and an op two in the same program without having to sort of re-zero the machine out or anything like that. Cool. So I just, it's okay. It is a old. Um, I turned the header off because it was very loud and fumey. I only have a diesel header. So, um, same thing. I'm just going to come in 
I don't really care about this. I'm just going to use my facing operation. I uh, do a facing operation. Um, now the reason. Hmm. Okay. This is where programming programming becomes an art a little bit because there are multiple ways to do something, and uh, there isn't necessarily a right or wrong way. Everyone has their own spin on it. So, um, first off, if I click on the stock here, there is still going to be a bunch of excess stock sitting around the outside here. Now, what's going to happen with that when I throw it in the mill and I run my face mill over the top of it is this stuff here is going to make a hell of a racket. Um, it's just going to vibrate against the face mill. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to come in with and do a 2D adaptive clearing pass. Um, so 11 again. Um, just around the outside there. And I'm just going to add radial stock to leave. We'll add a millimetre to that. Axial stock to leave. Um, zero. Um, heights. I'm just going to go negative three. Uh, negative two. Um, now, why I'm going to do that is it's going to, I will also turn on both ways. Um, it's just going to get rid of that little bit of excess stock that's around the outside there. So my face mill doesn't make lots of noise when it's coming over the part. Um, next thing I'm going to do is just come in with face mill. But one thing I don't want to do is I don't want the face mill look. Um, most of you, you guys have seen the look that I'm sort of going for at the moment or what I'm hoping to achieve, which is this, this knurled look. Um, now, the reason for the knurl on the parts at the moment um, is because uh, we're trying to, trying to create parts that are going to be a little bit more robust. And they, if they do get scratched, one of the downfalls about aluminium is it does scratch fairly easily. Um, it is, it's actually a more rigid material than steel, um, but uh, it, it, it is very soft, also at the same time, a very soft surface. So um, it, scratches do show up relatively easily. So one way to avoid that is to increase the surface area of the material. And to increase the surface area, well, the way I've chosen to do that is to add a knurl to the top of the material. Um, that means if it does get scratched, the scratches are less pronounced, I guess. Um, so I'm going to face it off. I'm going to go from model top. I'm actually going to leave 1.5 millimeters on top of it because I need a little bit, a little bit of meat for that ball mill to come in and do a knurl. Cool. That's good. Um, next thing I'm going to do is I just want to come in uh, and I just want to bore these holes out here. I may as well do all that in one go. Um, I'll use, uh, actually, I might just, yeah, I'll do that. Um, so let's go bore again. First thing I'll do is I'll do bore. Again, I'm just going to use tool 20, tool 21. Um, this is one of my favorite tools to use. Um, uh, flex home diameter. Always forget that one. Heights tab, um, whole top plus one millimeter, safety height. Um, cool, it's looking pretty good. Um, I will also select this guy here as well. And I will come in and I will do also do a 2D adaptive. And I'll select this face in here. And press OK. And then I will do a horizontal machining boundary selection. That'll be my selection there. Tool outside boundary, tool center on boundary. Tool inside boundary is what I want. I want to do stock to leave, radial stock to leave. I'm going to do negative 0.025. Now, uh, the reason why 
is because there's a cap that has to be pressed in here and I just need to make sure that it's not a press fit. Um, so I'm going to do the same thing to the cap. So in total, there'll be negative um, 0 0.05. Um, so tolerancing parts sometimes, this is how I do it. Um, I find it really easy to do it, do it this way. And again, I'll just zero that. Um, Axial stop to leave, just going to leave that at zero. Um, so what negative is going to do is it's going to bite into the material in this way, um, and it's going to take an extra 0 0.025 millimetres off, um, and that's going to allow me to tolerance it to the size that I want, because the way that I've designed is a, is a, is a press fit, a snug. Um, there's no margin in there. I could go back and I could redesign it to have a margin in there, um, but again, I... I I prefer to do it based off the tools that I have. I know, like I said, tools are never true to their size. Depending on what material you're cutting, how fast you're cutting, you'll get tool deflection. So um, I, I prefer to do it this way and, and use um, sock to leave to tolerance the part to um, be a fit that I like. <coughs> Aha, there's an issue. What is there an issue for? Um, was the machine what um, hmm okay that is a little odd ah I will reduce that and I'll make that center on boundary and we'll just see what that'll do ah oh, there you go okay so there's something that it didn't like Uh, oh, I don't want it center on boundary though. No, I don't want it to touch that top. So I will go inside boundary. It did not, for some reason, it did not like having additional offset added to it. Not entirely sure why. It was something to do with the new drill wizard. Um, so there's a new drilling wizard with infusion. Oh. No, sorry, hole wizard, hole recognition. Hole recognition tool, that's right. I haven't had much of a play with it, although it does look pretty good. Cool. <clears throat> um, next thing I'm going to do is just come in and I'm going to do a drill. Again, um, that is not the drill that I want. that the drill that I really want is a 4.2 because I'm now using cup taps so I'll do that and select some matter that's fine um, I'm going to do a negative offset on this now the reason being I'm going to do negative two millimeters the reason being is because when I my um, tap I am going to tap to the whole bottom. So that means there's two millimeters of clearance between the bottom of the drill and the and and where the tap's gonna go to depth wise. Um, taps still scare me a little bit. Um, I have broken a lot of taps. Um, but you know, it's all part of learning at the end of the day. Um, we're all here to learn. Um, and then I'm just gonna use a Cut tap, M5 cut tap, and again, I'm just going to select this, uh, select same diameter, um, height, so I'm just going to put a little bit of extra height on the tap just to be safe, just so that means that it'll start the tapping operation about a millimetre above the hole. Um, again, uh, taps, um, they come down, they start moving when it comes down, and then it stops, and then it starts moving just above the hole, and I've had it before where there was some excess stock left on top of the material and it didn't start rotating until it had already touched the hole um, and that's less than ideal. So again, it's good just to add a little bit of margin. I like to just go through just it and click through my operations, what I've already got there, what I still need to do. Um, cool. That is looking pretty good. Um, next thing that I need to do is I need to come in and do a 2D contour. 
actually, I might leave my 2D contour for now. Um, like I was saying, I'm very big on this knurl. So the way that I do the knurl is I do a parallel and then I will use a ball mill. Um, it's tool number, it's that one there. I need to delete that guy actually because that is not used for anything anymore. Cool. Um, I'm going to go into my, so basically I'm going to use uh, a 3D parallel. Um, if I was to press OK and load this now, um, I think I've, I've said to many people before, 3D toolpaths can recognize features, 3D features. Um, that is great. So uh, what we need to do is we need to constrain the toolpath so it doesn't basically go and, and inside our features. Now, there's a couple of problems here. One problem is my step over is way too big, so the null is going to look a little bit silly. The other problem is if we can have a look at here, the tool is going down inside some of these holes here, and that is both wasted time and potentially dangerous. If there was still stock in these holes, um, the tool would plunge down in the hole here and snap it off. So, what I am going to do instead, there's a couple of ways I can do that. One is I can avoid touch surfaces. Um, the problem with this avoid touch surfaces is I have to go around and I have to really select every surface that it is touching. So I have got a better way for that. Um, I'll turn that off. Well, it might be a better way. Um, the way that I do that is I go into patch. And in patch, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create some patches. And I'm going to patch this. I'm going to patch this. I'm just going to create a whole bunch of new bodies. Patch this. Patch this. And this is just to um, reduce wearing out the machine. And now it does mean the machine's going to be cutting dead air for a little bit, which could potentially take longer. But it also means that the machine's not doing lots of sharp cornering. So now I have a bunch of bodies. These are all bodies. I can come through. I can turn the light bulbs off on them. Um, these bodies, they're just, all, all they are is it's, it's a patch surface, so it's got no weight to it. It's got no mass to it. Um, and then I'm just going to go back into manufacture. One thing that's a pain here, if I was to just go in this one toolpath, you will see that it will still plunge down inside these here. It hasn't recognized that I've put a patch in. So what I need to do is right click back on my setup again. Click on model and I need to select all of these patches to include them in my setup. Um, once I've got my parallel sorted, I'm going to come back in again. I'm going to lock my parallel and I'm going to come back in again and I'm going to deselect all of these. Um, Cool. And now what I'll do is I'll just go and regenerate just the parallel for the moment because I can regenerate everything else later on. That's not a big deal. Cool. So as you can see, we're no longer plunging down to those holes. Um, but we are going to be cutting a little bit of air. But at the end of the day, um, it means that the machine's not continuously changing direction um, and it means that the program is going to be reduced. The program size will be a bit smaller as well. So um, that helps and I've had some issues lately with the Haas and program sizes. Um, that is still not yet, still not resolved as of yet, but uh, hopefully later on this week it will be. Um, sounds like we've got a response from Haas. Would be causing it. Sounds like it's a firmware issue, so they're going to wipe the machine clean and put brand new firmware on it. So, what I'm just going to do here is I'm going to change my step over. I'm going to do a two millimeter step over. I'm going to change, if I press OK now, everyone can see that I've got a two millimeter step over. Um, to create a knurl, I need to go both ways. So what I'm going to do is I can come back into here. I can add perpendicular passes, 
and I'm also going to add a pass direction. I'm going to make that pass direction 45 degrees. So now if I press OK, aha, there we go. That looks a bit better. I could make that pass direction anything I want. I could also come back in and I can turn off and perpendicular passes. Um, press OK and that's what we'd be ended up end up with is just passes in one direction. Um, so adding perpendicular passes just saves re going through and doing the same toolpath. Now one thing you'll notice is I haven't had to come into geometry. I haven't had to select anything. Um, again, 3D toolpaths are awesome. They automatically recognize the geometry. So um, Let's add perpendicular passes. Um, now, that is looking pretty good. Um, I will do a quick simulation before I lock the toolpath so you can have a look at how that will look. Just speed that up a little bit. There we go. Uh, camera on the side. Now you can just there's little raised ridges there. That's what I'm looking for. It does increase machining time. That's true. But um, to be honest, I'd prefer to create premium parts and increase my machining time by a little bit um, than just. Because it would be so easy to just come in here and face this material off and go and send those parts out to customers. and um, But I'm not happy with that. Um, I want to make parts that I'm proud of. Cool. So um, the ball mill is, funnily enough, actually just a little ChipX ball mill. Um, this is the same one that ChipX sell... Uh, all the Vertigo uses. Um, now, ChipX sell it as a 6mm cutter. As you can see, it is definitely not 6mm. It is 5.985mm. I mean, it's not far off 6mm, but it's not 6mm. So, um, like I said, when when you buy a cutter and they tell you it's 8mm or it's 6mm, it's, it's never that size. What I'm going to do here is I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to protect this toolpath. Now the reason being is, like I said, I want to come back in and I'm going to deselect and get rid of um, all those extra bodies that I don't want. So the way that I'm just going to do that is I'm just going to exit all of it and just select this one body and then I'm just going to come back up into model and I'm just going to turn off, uh, nope, nope, I'm going to turn off all these bodies here. Get rid of all of those. Now I can do that because like I said, this is protected. It's got a little padlock next to it now. Um, so because there's a padlock, even if I come up here and I hit generate, um, it's not going to affect anything. All my references are locked into this guy. Cool. Um, so we're going to a adaptive. We're just going to get rid of that ex excess stock that's going to cause us some issues. Come in with my face mill, just take uh, a millimeter off, I think it is. Just going to leave 1.5 between here and here. Um, that 1.5 is going to give a, give the knurling toolpath just a little bit of meat to bite into um, to actually give a knurl in the first place. Um, again, boring operation. I'm just going to bore all these holes. Now, one thing I need to do is I need to switch this around. Reason being is, see, if I look at... This guy here, for instance. Now, this isn't quite going to work because where that bore starts is just above the surface here. The problem is, is there's still meat in that surface, so I need to take the tool path and just shift it and move it to here. So then I've got facing operation, adaptive bore. That's what I want. Cool. And then I'm going to do a horizontal. Just give that a nice clean up. It's going to surface a nice clean up as well. Um, the only thing I'm going to do with that bore, this horizontal here actually, um, no, I've already done that. Right, what I was going to say is um, negative stock to leave, but I've already done that. So 
maybe uh, maybe it's time for bed. I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> yes. Um, do a tap, and then we're going to do our parallel. Um, then after the parallel, I'm just going to come in with a contour, uh, chamfer mill, tool number five. I'm going to click on all these chamfers. Always make sure you select the bottom edge because if you accidentally top edge and then you do a negative offset, it will bite into the material. There needs to be an auto selection button for this. Um, unfortunately, there isn't one as of yet. So I've got all these counter bores here because um, I'm a big fan of using cap screws these days. Um, cap screws tend to, the, the, the heads last longer on the cap screws. Um, so you can undo them and do them up and you can also torque them properly. Um, I'm sick of using uh, Loctite so um, hopefully this helps a little bit. Um, tip offset, one millimeter tip offset, gain. Um, and I just want to do a finishing overlap of a millimetre is fine. Press OK and we'll see how that comes up. Cool, it's looking pretty good. Um, last thing I need to add is a chamfer. So I'll just do a chamfer around the outside here. Um, again, this is going to be a one mil chamfer. I'm going to do a tip offset of um, yeah, about a millimetre is fine because um, that's a millimetre past the actual chamfer um, that that tip offset is. So uh, it's extra clearance. Um, this one here is an interesting one, um, chamfer clearance. Uh, if you're ever having issues getting your chamfer to go nice and close to high walls or walls in general, um, you can reduce this value here, um, chamfer clearance. Uh, currently it's 0 0.635. Um, I'll typically make it 0 0.1 depending on what I'm cutting next to. Um, it's, yeah, it doesn't hurt to change that. Uh, finishing overlap, I'll do a 2 millimeter finishing overlap. It's fine. Cool. Um, the only other thing I'm probably going to add to this, and I might, may as well do it right now, is I want to do an engrave. I want to put the LV here. I want that to look, that'll be a pretty cool look. So it's going to insert um, an SVG, insert SVG. And the SVG has shown up way over here. So I'll just drag it into place. Um, blow it up, make it a little bigger. And zoom out a little bit. Um, I'm not too worried about exact placement. Um, sometimes I am, but not for this. That was pretty good. Um, let's press OK. Now there's, the SVG's come in and it, it's broken, so I'm just going to grab my line tool and just fix that. Easy. Easy, easy. Cool. Now I've got two closed sketches. Um, next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to extrude those negative 0.25 into the material. That'll give me my V. That looks pretty good. Um, awesome. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I am going to do a, a Sketch because what I want to do um, yeah I want, I want to do an offset I just remember how I did it on these I did um, some other parts a little while ago I'll find them gantry plates gantry plates that's what I did I did a really nice um, chamfer with a ball mill on there, and I just want to remember how I did that. So quite often I go backwards to old files and just check them out. So new gantry plates on the new machine. Um, fancy V. 
Um, ah, cool. Nope, it will be this. Nope, it's this. There we go. That's what we want. Um, so, trace. Okay, cool. So it's just tracing the outside line there. That's fine. I will just measure to see what the difference is in height. In 61. This will definitely be smaller. Uh, yeah, it's just 10, 10 to 17 mils off. So I can still do that. Um, I'm just going to do a go back to manufacture. <coughs> I'm going to go down and I'm going to use trace. And I'm going to come in and grab that ore mill again. Um, I'm going to select this and I'm going to select this. And I'm going to do stock to leave. I'm going to do a negative stock to leave on this. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do a negative radial stock to leave, zero. Radial stock to leave on um, traces does not work. So they've just put it in there, I guess. Um, Let's go negative 0 0.2 for the moment, and we'll see how that comes up, and then I can always come back and, and regenerate and make a little modification if I need to. <coughs> um, I'm going to repeat the passes. With the ball mill, if I'm cutting with the end of the ball mill um, and you do it once, you can quite often end up with little chatter marks in the bottom. Um, again, this, the this, the very tip of the ball mill is the the surface speed on it is so slow that it's not um, you're not going to be able to uh, really remove much material. So you're in the, all you're doing in is is rubbing really. Um, so again, I just come in with a repeat finishing pass just to fix that up. <coughs> Um, I press OK. Cool. Now what we can do, if I I can regenerate all of this, yes. I think I'm going to do is this is a bit of a waste of time. So what I what I like to do is just make sure that my tools are all in order, um, because there's no point calling up a tool, calling up another tool, and then bringing up the previously used tool. You want to keep your tool changes as low as possible. Machine wear, all the rest of it. Um, cool. So, trace. Yep. Yeah. Cool. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to simulate this, and I am actually going to turn my body off. And let's see how it comes up. I'll speed that up a little bit. Part has gone. There we go. Cool. That is looking pretty. Nerl pat, nerled pattern on the top there. We've got that nice looking engrave. Um, Ball mill's doing an awesome job of engraving. Um, I got a little three mil, no, two mil ball mill the other day. I'm really looking forward to trying that out at some point. Um, Again, just gives it'll just give an awesome finish. Cool, all that is looking pretty good. I will turn my part back on again. And just regenerate this guy. Cool, so op one, op two, done. Easy. Um, from here. I am just going to edit this. I'm just going to change this again to number one. Now the problem, uh, reason why I'm going to do that is, what I do is I I like to post both operations out at the same time, so that way I could do op one in my left hand vice and op two in my right hand vice. Now the problem is, is if op one is um, set to zero and op two is set to two, it won't work. If I do that, it'll come up that it's failed to post. Because the way that I post those two operations together is I click that, shift, click this guy, right click, post process, um, and then I post them out together basically. 
Um, but like I said, if this was set to zero, um, it would post, but I would get a failed, I would say something like program.nc failed. Um, cool. For now, I'm just going to post this guy out by itself, do a test, make sure everything's good, and then the next time I come back in, I'll just post the second one out by itself as well. So, Post. Um, I've got a little Haas folder, VF2SS network. Um, delete folder on my machine. I was going to overwrite note. Um, I was going to overwrite this file that's here already. Let's go post. Yes. And there we go. So now I can run over to the machine and run the job. Cool. Um, thanks for watching those that did stick around. Cheers.